Okay, so we're going to start with the uh, engineering concepts handout, which is this one with text, and it's got a colorful graph on the back. So what we're going to talk about is basically how a DC motor performs. I'll pull up the web page here. Okay, so in FRC and, and in FTC as well, all of the motors that we use are what are called, they're, they're DC. Does everybody know what DC means? Yes? Direct current. Direct current. Does everybody know what direct current means? Okay, so basically not alternating current, and that's all the detail I'm going to get into on that. So anyways, to, uh, both FTC, I believe, and FRC robots run on 12 volts DC. Um, so we're using direct current motors. And then in addition to that, we're using what's called a brushed direct current motor. So there, there are two kinds of, well, there's, there's more than two, but there's two classes of motors, brushed and brushless. Basically, I'm not going to get into really exactly how they work, but brushless motors um, are quite a bit more efficient, but they require really complicated electronics to drive the motor. Um, brushless motors are really simple. I mean, you can just hook a brushless motor up to a battery and it'll spin. Brushed, uh, brushed motors are what you see in a lot of like toys and like hand drills, things like that. There's usually anything that runs off the DC current, those are usually brushed motors. Um, brushless motors are used in like high precision CNC machines. Um, they're used in uh, like electric cars because they were very, very, they're very, very powerful for their size. So, what we're using is brushed motors um, with one exception. Technically, there is one motor in FRC that's brushless that's legal, but I'll go into that a little later. Um, so DC motors have um, pretty simple properties, right? They, they, they perform in a really simple way. Brushless motors, they perform a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to go into that. but You'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. So this website here is um, a website that Vex Robotics put together a couple of years ago. And basically what they did was they took a whole bunch of motors that are really common in FRC. They sent them out to a third party, I assume a third party, for testing. They hooked the electric motor up to a, a machine called a dyno, which is basically, um, I mean, it's similar to a chassis dyno or an engine dyno for a car, basically how they measure power output and things for, for engines, and they do it the same thing for electric motors. So they hooked it up to a little motor dyno, did a bunch of tests. So um, these different motors, in, in, our, in our COTS segment, we're gonna talk about these different types of motors, and uh, we're gonna talk about kind of what they do. But basically, this website is the most common motors in FRC, um, and their, their performance. So there's basically, when we're, when we're talking about a, 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 a DC motor, a brushed DC motor, there's a few things you need to know. We've, as we've kind of gone through this, we've talked about some different things. We need to know the parameters, right? We're, you want to know how big something is. You want to know how powerful a motor is, right? You've got to know the parameters. So there's a few important parameters when it comes to brushed DC motors. So probably the, the easiest one to understand is what's called the free load speed. Basically, the free load speed is if I take, uh, let me back up a second, before I go into that, all this stuff I'm going to be talking about here right now is, especially on this website, is when the motor is given its operating voltage. So when you, when you look at a data sheet for a motor, it's going to say this motor is for 12 volts or this motor is for 24 volts, right? So all the testing is done right at that voltage. Okay, so the free load speed, when the motor is connected to its operating voltage is basically the speed that the motor shaft will spin up to when the motor is just like sitting there, not connected to anything. So you just have a motor sitting on the table, you hook it up to a battery that's giving it exactly 12 volts. The sim motor in this case will spin at 5,330 RPM. Okay, that's that's the free load speed. Right. 
we'll go into the more of that in a, in a second. So then there's there's something called stall torque. Okay, stall torque. Um, stall basically means to stop. Okay, so, so when we talk when we start talking about a motor being stalled, we mean the motor is under so much load that it can't move. Okay, that's what we mean when we say it's stalled. Some, something's preventing the motor from turning, so the motor's not turning. So when the motor when the motor is stalled and it's given its um, uh, operating voltage, that's the most torque that the motor is going to produce. Right? As the motor speeds up, the, the torque is going to decrease. We'll talk about that in a second. But the most torque a motor produces is when the rotor is stalled. Okay. So another so the, another important parameter for a motor is the stall torque. How much torque is generated when you stall that motor? Okay. In the case of a sim. It is 2.41 newton meters, which, if I remember correctly, is 6.28 inch pounds. So not a lot, but it's I mean it's something. Um, typically, with motors without any gearing, the stall torque's low. Not not it's not high enough to really do anything useful. You have to gear the motor down before it's really good for anything. Um, okay, so that's. That's uh, free load speed and stall torque. Now, uh, in addition to that, we want to know the free load current, basically how much current is drawn, how many amps of electrical current is drawn when the motor is just running at free load speed. Um, as far as I know, I, I really didn't do a whole lot of looking at this, but as far as I know, that current basically represents the amount of energy that's just being lost in the motor to heat and to friction internal to the motor. Because if, if I'm not mistaken, if there were no resistance and if there was no friction in the motor, the free load current would always be zero, if I'm not mistaken. But so basically, there's going to be a little, it's going to draw a very little current at free load speed, not much. I mean, in the case of a sim, it's, it's less than three amps, <coughs> um, which is not much when compared to how much current the motor normally draws. So, so at free load speed, it's not going to draw much current, but it's going to draw some. Um, and then we want to know the stall current. When the motor is stalled, how much current is it going to draw? And it's going to be a lot. Um, in, the, in the case of the sim, it's 131 amps okay, at 12 volts. So those, those four things are kind of, they've kind of fully defined the motor's performance. If you know those four numbers, as far as I know, you can you can calculate any other parameter of the motor you want to know. As far as I know. Um, now, there's one more there's one more parameter that that you would typically see on a motor data sheet, and that's this maximum power number. Now, if I remember correctly, you should be able to calculate maximum power from those other parameters. However, typically, it's it's useful to just know what that is, because when you're, when you're comparing two motors, which one's more powerful, that, that power, that max power number tells you a lot about the motor's performance without needing to know all the other stuff. Um, let's see, am I talking about power later? Well, we'll talk about power in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna click on this and it's gonna give us a lot more information. So this, this is the same graph that's printed on the back of your sheet, but it's a little easier to see here. So, um, all right, so basically most of the, when you're looking at, okay, how much, how fast is a motor moving and how much torque is it producing at any one point in time on your robot, right? Say you're you're accelerating your drivetrain. You want to know how much torque is are the motors producing at any one time, or you're you're moving an arm, right? Basically, all of the performance statistics, performance data, I guess about the motor, they're all related to speed, right? So as the motor speeds up and slows down, the power output, the torque, the current it's drawing, all of those change in relation to speed. Okay, now. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about um, brushed motors being very, very simple. This is, I don't know a lot about how brushless motors 
perform, and actually it depends on exactly what type of brushless motor it is, but in the case of brushed motors, um, the relation between speed and any of the other parameters is very, very simple. So um, we see down at the bottom of this graph, this is what's called a motor curve. Whenever anybody talks about a motor curve, this is the graph that they're talking about. When you buy a motor and you look at the data sheet, or you, if, you're, if you're going to a place that sells motors and you're looking at data sheets, pretty much every single one of them is going to have a graph that looks pretty much just like this on it. Now, some industrial motor providers will only give you a slice of the graph. Like, they won't give you all of it. Because for industrial applications, typically, you don't really care much about what the motor does at low speed. So if you see a graph that doesn't look like it's complete, that might be why. But for FRC, you'll never run into that. Um, OK, so, so at the bottom of the graph, we have speed. Right over here is 0 RPM. This is stall. So the left side of the graph here, this is stall. The right side of the graph, uh, this point right here where everything kind of ends, that's the preload speed of the motor. So the yellow line is torque, okay? So you see on the left, the point all the way here at stall, this is the stall torque, right? And you can see it decreases all the way until it hits zero at the preload speed. Now, the nice thing about this is that's a straight line, right? It looks like a straight line, it is a straight line. Now, in real life, and there might be a little bit of noise just for manufacturing variances, but for all intents and purposes, it's a very straight line. So it's what we call a linear relation, right? If I if I increase my speed by 10 RPM, my my torque that the motor is outputting is gonna drop by some amount. If I if I increase by another 10 RPM, the torque is gonna drop by that same amount. If I torque increase my speed by 20 RPM, my torque is going to drop by twice that amount, right? That makes sense. It's, it's a linear relation, so it's, it's just basically multiplication. So um, now this is really this is really what where the preload speed comes from is this this linear relation between torque and um, speed. So as you can imagine, when the motor starts turning, there's a lot of torque. Okay. And, and torque, when you apply torque to a rotating mass, in, in the case of our example, the rotor of the motor, right, the shaft of the motor, it weighs something, right? It takes torque to accelerate that and to spin it up. So if you, if you apply torque to a mass that can rotate, it will start to rotate, and it will, it will accelerate proportionally to how much torque you put on it, right? So if you put twice as much torque, it's going to accelerate angularly twice as fast. Um, so if you, if you think about it, when you start, when you start at zero and you apply power to the motor, it's going to accelerate really fast right away because you have a lot of torque, right? It'll accelerate just the shaft of the motor will accelerate really fast. But as it accelerates, right, as it accelerates, it moves right on this graph, okay? And as you move right on this graph, the torque decreases. So you're still accelerating, right, because there's still torque present, but the torque is decreasing, so the rate at which you're accelerating is decreasing the faster and faster you get. Um, basically, and then basically, eventually you reach a point where you're not generating any torque anymore. And if you don't have any torque, you can't accelerate. Right, so, so that's, that's really what causes there to be a preload speed. Really. So if you look at a graph of a, of a DC motor accelerating, you know, if this is time, actually it wouldn't be V, B. this is the RPM of the motor, it looks something, the acceleration curve looks something like that. Um, Okay, so there's another thing that's, in, that's fairly important, and, and we're going to try to pay a little bit more attention to it this year because we've had some issues with this in the past. 
burning out motors because we tend to overload them. Um, this bl dotted blue line here is the current that's being drawn. Okay. Now notice, just like torque, it starts high and it decreases linearly with speed. Or it, it decreases linearly with increasing speed, I should say. Um, so you'll notice we've got two straight lines. Basically, there, that means that current and torque are proportional to each other. Right, so if I double my torque, if I double my torque, I double the current I'm drawing. If I half the current I'm drawing, I half my torque. Okay. Now, I wasn't going to go into it, but I, I probably should, so I'm going to. So let's let's talk a little bit about why why the motor behaves this way. Okay. Why does the torque decrease as speed increases? So if I have a motor, I'm going to draw a diagram and I'm going to butcher it. So um, So this, this is a circuit, right? This is a battery, positive side here, or negative side here, positive side here. Current flows from the negative side through the motor and back to the battery. Okay, this is essentially what's going on in our robot, right? With some other stuff in between. Now, I, I don't, I think there's a convention, but I don't remember what it is. So let's just say when we apply current to a DC motor in this direction, it turns this way, right? Let's just let's just say that that's what happens. So, if and the thing about DC motors is if you flip, if you flip the polarity, right? If I hook this wire up to this side of the motor and that wire up to the other side of the motor, the motor will start rotating in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, with AC motors, that's not quite the case. AC motors typically have three wires instead of two, and it's a little more complicated. Um, all right. So let's let's say that the motor turns in that direction. Now let's let's remove power from the system and let's look at let's look at let's look at the motor not as a motor but as a generator. Okay, because basically a motor is a generator. If you, if you put the motor up to a steam turbine or something and, and, and run it, it will generate electricity. Okay. So we've got our motor here, but it's not acting as a motor anymore, it's acting as a generator. Let's, let's say that I hook it up to a, an engine or something and I turn it in this same direction. What, which side of the motor is going to be positive and which side of the motor is going to be negative? Well, what's going to happen is um, I guess I draw it this way. But anyways, current's wanna, going to want to come out want this side and go in this side. Does that make sense? So basically, if you look, this is the opposite direction that current is moving here. Right? The motor is turning the same direction, but current is going the other way. Okay? So this creates what we call um, counter electromotive force. Okay? You've got current going this way, and you've got current wanting to go the other way. It's generating what's called back EMF, back electromotive force. And the, as it turns out, the voltage that you generate when you're turning, in this case, a brushed DC motor, the voltage that you generate is proportional to the speed. Okay, so for a particular motor, if, I, if I'm running at some speed and generating one volt, right, if I double the speed, I'll generate two volts. If I double the speed again, I'll generate four volts. If I, you know, triple the speed, I'll generate 12 volts. You know, if I double the speed above that, I'll generate 24 volts. Okay. So basically, those two forces fight each other. And so as you can imagine, if I'm applying 12 volts of electromotive force in the direction that I want the motor to go, 
but the motor's not turning, right? The motor's not, it, it's stationary. And I, and I just hook up power, I flip the switch, right? I turn it on. Okay, the motor's not moving, but I'm applying 12 volts to it, okay? It's not generating any back EMF, okay? So the motor, the motor allows current to flow through as fast as it can, right? And then as the motor starts to turn, slowly it generates a little bit of back EMF and that resists current going through the motor, okay? And, and that means that not quite as much current can go through the motor, which means that not as much torque can be produced, okay? But the motor continues to accelerate, like we talked about, it continues to accelerate, and as it accelerates, it generates a stronger and stronger back EMF until it gets to a point where the back EMF is equal to the voltage that you're applying to drive the motor. And at that point, no current is flowing through the motor, and it's not producing any torque. Okay? Now, in reality, that's a little bit of an idealized um, model. There's always going to be some torque flowing through the motor because there's energy lost for, from friction and heat. So there's always going to be a little bit of current going through the motor, which is why we talked about um, preload current. However, generically speaking, that's what works. So, so basically, so basically, as the motor's turning, it's generating a force that's resisting electricity going into it. So the important thing to remember here is that at a particular voltage, current equals torque. Okay, but the motion of the motor doesn't allow as much current to go through the motor at higher speeds. So that's why you see this, this behavior. Um, the green curve, let's talk about the green curve next. So the green curve is power. Now, power is measured in watts. Power is a unit of work, okay? Now, work is basically the energy that you exert when you're doing something. Doing something, we'll call it useful. I'm not sure what the correct physics term is, but, but basically, if I, if I push against this wall, Right? I can apply a, a thousand pounds of force to the wall if I want to, but I'm not doing any work because the wall's not going anywhere. But if I, if I you know, push this chair, the chair doesn't have wheels, but if I push a chair with wheels, um, it'll roll. Right? I'm applying maybe a pound of force to it, and I'm moving at some speed because the chair can move. I'm doing work. Okay? So if you're not moving and you're applying a force, you're, not, you're still not doing any work, right? Okay, if you're not moving and you're not applying any force, you're not doing any work, obviously, okay? If I'm applying a force, like to the wall, but I'm not moving, I'm not doing any work. And if I'm moving, but I'm not applying any force, I'm also not doing any work, okay? So that, that's the two ends of this green line, okay? Here, I'm not moving, but I'm applying a lot of force. So at this end of the graph, the green line's like pushing on the wall. Okay. This end of the graph, I'm moving really fast, but I'm not applying any torque because my green line has dropped to zero, or not my green line, my yellow line has dropped to zero. Okay, so I'm not applying any force, but I'm moving the 5,000 RPM. It's like sitting in the chair while it rolls across the floor, right? And you're not doing any work, you're just sitting there. Okay, that's why this, is, that's why this end of the green line is at zero. Then basically, um, the, the, Power output is the product is, is the product of torque and angular velocity. Right, so if I just take the torque I'm producing, multiply it by the angular velocity, I'll get how many watts I'm putting out. Uh, angular velocity has to be in torque has to be in newton meters, and angular velocity has to be in radians per second for that to work. But basically, basically power output, the work I'm doing, is equal to the torque times angular velocity. And then, so that's why you get that peak kind of in the middle when your torque's pretty high and your speed's pretty high, right? And then this red line here is basically just the efficiency, right? Um, basically how much electrical energy am I turning into work is really, is really what that red line represents. So you can see it peaks somewhere around 75, 80% of the freeload speed. Now, 
when we get to the build season, we're going to design gear trains mainly for our drive train. And when we're flooring it across the field, right, we typically design our drive train to top out at about 80% of the preload speed of the motor. Okay, because we, we're assuming that friction, that friction is going to get us down because of the belts and the things, there's enough friction to slow the motor down. We're not going to be running at the preload speed of the motor. That brings us down somewhere in this range, which is a good range to be because that's where we're hitting peak efficiency anyways. Um, however, when we're, I don't, I'm not going to really go into this, but, but if we're designing a shooter, we tend to design more around the half, the halfway point, which is where we see max power. Max power is right at half of preload speed. So we, we try to design for that when we're doing something with a shooter. I'm not going to go into why that is, but it has to do with Sometimes you care about sometimes you care about speed. Sometimes you care about torque. Sometimes you care about power. Um, you, you care a little bit about all three, but sometimes you need one or the other more than the other. So um, here's the other thing to remember: the the sim can draw 131 amps at stall. Okay. Um, if I okay, so if I take a wire a thin wire and I just hook it up to two ends of the battery, what happens? You guys ever done that? I've certainly done it. You guys ever done that? <laughs> Take a thin piece of copper hooked up to a battery, what, what happens to it? Snaps. Okay. Uh, circuit. Well, it does complete the circuit, but if you have your hands on it, it's hot. It gets hot. Why would it's you really do hot. that? <laughs> I was a dumb kid. I don't get all kinds of dumb things. Um, but anyways, if I take a thin piece of wire and I just hook it up to two ends of the battery, the wire gets pretty hot pretty quick. Okay. Um, and that's because the wire has some resistivity. There's a lot of current going through it because there's nothing stopping the current from going through just a straight piece of wire. So, so basically when a motor is sitting still, right, and there's no back EMF preventing current from going through the system, it's literally, I mean, it's coiled. It's a coil of wire, but that really doesn't change the, the the scene a whole lot. Um, it delays the effects a little bit because of inductance, but don't worry about that. Um, basically, the, the, the wire is going to get hot when you dump 131 amps through that wire. So that's how you smoke a motor out, is you, you don't allow there to be any back EMF to slow current down. You dump a whole bunch of current through it, the wire heats up, the casing melts, and the motor shorts out the terminal. So when you smoke a motor, that's what happens. And actually, the smoke that comes out of a motor when you burn it out is actually the, there's a thin, very thin epoxy coating on the actual wire <coughs> or enamel coating. Anyways, there's a thin coating on the actual wire before they wind it in the actual motor. When you, that smoke is actually that burning off because the wire got so hot that it's, it's vaporizing the, the coating. And then once that coating's gone, the, the coils that are sitting next to each other start touching and they, they make an electrical short and then your motor doesn't work anymore because it's not a coil, it's just a lump of copper. So, um, there's motor curves for all the common motors, which we're gonna go over here in a second. Um, I don't know that I have anything else. This is a really great website. Like, very looks nice. They gives you all kinds of data. And they also do other other kinds of tests. Um, they've got all kinds of data here. This is where they they lock the rotor, right? They just keep the motor from turning. They apply power to it. They see how long it takes to fail at different voltages. You can see at 12 volts, which is this green line, it takes about you know 35, 40 seconds for a sim to burn out completely. But you can see right away, the, the tor this is measuring torque. The torque that it produces drops pretty quick. So anyways, there's a lot of great information on here. And there's these graphs for all these different motors. Um, this motor here is an FTC motor. But um, it's legal in FRC, so it's on the list. Um, any questions about motor curves or motor performance? During the season, this will become important. Um, I just wanted to explain.
explain all that? Because it was like I was graduated before I finally went and read and figured out how all this stuff worked. Like when I was a student, I didn't really understand why motors work the way they work. So it's useful and it helps you when you're designing. So um, that's that handout. Let's move on to the costs and let's talk about some actual specific motors and let's talk about their performance. And I'm just going to use this website here because it's nice. All right. So, <coughs> the sim motor, which is the one we were just looking at, we're just looking at the graph. Oh, a quick note before I before I finish. Uh, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end here. All right. Anyways, top top motor, top of the list this is the sim motor. The sim motor is fairly large, two and a half inches in diameter, about four and a half inches long. The sim motor is the second most powerful motor that we have in first. Okay, it's the heaviest motor we have. Um, we use it on our drivetrains nearly exclusively. Actually, for on Stellar, that's the only motor we've ever used on a drive. That might change, but that's the motor we use. Um, it's very, very difficult to burn that motor out. Now, the reason it's difficult to burn that motor out basically comes down to the fact that it's heavy. When a motor is heavier, there's more material. Basically, the rotor of the motor is a piece of steel, and then the copper is wound around that piece of steel. Well, basically, that piece of steel, if it's larger, it takes longer to heat up and it pulls heat out of the wires and stops the, the wires and the coils from heating up too quickly. Now it also happens that the, the rest of the motor, the whole outside casing of the motor, is made out of aluminum, which is a good heat sink that helps pull heat away. I assume the wires are probably thicker inside, I don't know for sure. But either way, it's a very difficult motor to burn out. As you can see, from that locked rotor stall test, which is the thing I just showed you, this guy here, it takes 35 seconds to burn this motor out completely, which is a long time. Like, I mean, that, that is a long time for a motor to be stalled without failing completely. So, um, sim motor is good for drivetrains because you get the pushing wars. You tend to stall the motor a lot in a drivetrain. So whatever motor you're using in your drivetrain, you're going to stall them a lot. So they've got to be able to handle being in a locked rotor state for you know as long as possible. Okay, so uh, the next motor is the 775 Pro, which is this motor here, or the Red Line. Basically, last fall, Andy Mark released the Red Line, and the Red Line motor is the 775 Pro motor. It's just a different color, and they released it as their own product, but it's just a copy of the other thing. They actually, Animark just went to the same. Vex originally had the seven, they went to a company and had the 775 Pro motor built, and then Animark just kind of went behind their back and went to that same company and said, hey, can you make these for us too? And they were like, yeah, but we want you to paint them red. So they painted them red, and they called it the Red Line motor. So the 775 Pro and the Red Line are the same thing. We've got some of both on the robot upstairs. Um, actually, the robot's not upstairs, it's out the fairgrounds, but, um, well, there is a robot upstairs. Anyways, we've got red lines and the 75 Pros on our robots. Um, they're interchangeable. They are the most powerful motor that we have available to us. Now, when I talk about most powerful motor, I'm talking about peak power, right? So a sim at peak power will put out 337 watts. Just for reference, one horsepower is 741, or 740, 746, okay. So um, a sim is kind of like roughly half a horsepower at peak power, right? And at peak power is when it's loaded to the point where it's only running half speed, right? So keep in mind that running a motor at half speed, I don't mean, I don't mean giving it half voltage, right? Because if you give it half voltage, it's going to run at half speed, 
Right? So if we give it six volts instead of 12, it'll run at half voltage. Well, that's not giving you peak power. You gotta run it at full voltage and load it until it's running half the speed. It'll put out about half a horsepower. So um, the on the other hand, the 775 Pro motor will put out, what, 10, 10 watts more? So very slightly more, but not much. But the thing about the 775 Pro motor is it weighs like a third, actually less than a third, weighs less than a third of what a sim weighs, and it's smaller too. The 775 Pro motor is only about that long. So the 775 mo Pro motor is quite a bit lighter, quite a bit smaller, and has slightly more power than the sim. So why wouldn't you use a 775 Pro slash Redline anywhere you'd use a sim motor? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yes? I'm guessing that it's a lot more expensive. It's actually cheaper. Yeah, it was cheaper too. Anybody got a different guess? Uh, some of you know. What size? Uh, the, the stall for me? No, the salt torque, well, uh, I'll get, I'm gonna get to that later. Does everybody remember to, well, nobody's here in 2016, gosh darn it. Hey, Coulter, never mind. Anyways, they burn out really, really easily. That's why. The motor is smaller, it's constructed differently internally, and it's quite a bit less durable in terms of heat. So that means that the 775 Pro motor is not good for applications where you're going to stall it a lot. We're using 775 Pro motors on our elevator. We're using 775 Pro motors on our intake. Yeah, we're using 775. Yeah, which we actually do stall, ironically enough. But we've got the gear ratio right to the point where we're okay to stall it. You wouldn't want to. Um, if you just held the button down and ran the intake when the cube was in, you would you would smoke those motors within a couple of seconds. So if we go if we go look at the, the 775 Pro motor, we go to the locked rotor stall test. So you, you see this graph. This looks a lot different than the sim, right? The sim at 12 volts, which is the green line, failed about here, right? About 35 seconds. At 12 volts, you know it fails here, like three, four, five seconds. You've got to go, you've got to cut the voltage down to six volts before you really start to get any kind of length of time at stall that the motor survives. So this, this graph really helps you tell how durable the motor is. Okay, so that's the 775 Pro slash Redline. I'm sure we'll use some of them next year. Um, if I have time at the end, I want to talk about those a little bit more. So then next, there's a mini sim motor, which is this guy right here. The mini sim came out in 2013. Basically, the mini sim is it's the same diameter as a sim. It's the same sh kind of shape. It's the same materials. It's built the same way. It's made by the same company. It's the same output shaft. It's just shorter. Okay. Basically, what they did was they took a sim and they decreased the stack length. And that's that's a term that's used in motors. Basically. It's, it is cheaper to make a motor shorter than it is to make a different diameter motor, right? Because they can use a lot of the same parts as a sim. They just use less of them in a row internally. Um, so basically, it's a sh shorter, stubbier sim. And basically, it's designed to be ish about a third of the weight, a third of the power, and a, a third of the length, right, is about what it comes out to be. Now it ends up being more than a third of the weight because of the end caps kind of screw up that equation. But basically, it's about a third of the power and about a third of the size. Now, it's it, it's slightly faster than the sim. Um, I don't know the exact reasons for that. I think it's probably just the way it worked out. So, so it runs a little closer to 6,000 RPM than to 5,000 RPM, but it, it's fairly similar. Um, basically, the sim motor is the only motor in FRC that we have a limit on right now. So, so we're only allowed to use six sim motors. All the other motors, back, back when I was a student, every single motor that you had had a limit on it. You were only allowed to use a couple of them on your robot. Until 2013, sims were limited to four. You weren't allowed to use six sims. Mini sims didn't exist. 
2013, they added a couple motors and they loosened up the limits. And then last year, they finally removed the limits from pretty much all the rest of the motors except for the SIM. It would not surprise me if we see the, the, the upper limit on SIMs go away this year. I, I hope it, it's kind of pointless at this point, but um, it's the only motor to limit. So, so the mini SIM is a good way to get around that limit because it's pretty much the same motor. Yeah, Caleb. What was the limit for? Do you know? Like, um, why did they add that? I don't know completely. I, I think an easier way to answer that question would be to answer why I think they removed the limit. I, why they removed the limit, I think, is because teams were running up against a different roadblock. So I think, I think with the motor limits, maybe teams were running up a, against a cost roadblock, or a complexity roadblock, or maybe motor control roadblocks. So they limited motors to kind of even the playing field a little bit. But now robots are so much more powerful and they have so many more like watts of power packed into all their mechanisms than they used to. The teams are running up against current limits rather than cost and complexity limits. So you're more in danger of you're more in danger of tripping the main breaker of the robot at any one time than you are of running out of money or weight. I guess is, is that's the best I can answer that. Um, okay, so so that's the mini sim motor. Some analysis was, was done end of last season, not 2018, 2017 season, um, comparing four sim drivetrains and six mini sim drivetrains because a six. Six mini sims and four sims, that's about the same amount of power. But six mini sims outperforms four sims by quite a bit because of how it handles current and heat and different things. So that, that's kind of an iffy thing. I don't think we're going to do it because, well, we've been running six sims, which is obviously better than six mini sims. But. Okay, uh, the next motor is the bag motor, which is this guy right here. Now, in the picture, it looks a lot like a sim. It's quite a bit smaller, the bag motor is about that big around and about that long. Um, the bag motor is a smaller motor. Smaller motors tend to run faster, right? So a mini sim and a sim, those are large motors. They're, they run about five, 6,000 RPM preload speed. Smaller motors tend to run up over 10,000 RPM preload speed. That just has to do with how they're constructed internally. And I'm fairly sure the fact that they're smaller actually adds to that. I don't, I don't know a lot about how that works. But um, basically, a bag motor, preload speed about 13,000 RPM. It's um, quite a bit lower power. Um, the bag motor is easier to burn out than a sim. We've burned out a bag motor, but it's harder to do than some other motors that we're going to talk about here in a second. So the bag motor is good for running you know, rollers and intakes and stuff. Our gear pickup last year had a bag motor on it. Our, our intake, our first intake was run off of bag motors. It's good for smaller, lower powered mechanisms. Um, it's a good little motor. There were some, it, came out, it also came out in 2013 and there were some issues with quality in 2013 where they had a defective batch and it got into circulation and so half the time you get your bag motor and basically what would happen is there was a dead, there was a dead spot on the commutator, which has to do with the brushes internally. But basically, if the motor stopped in a certain position, it wouldn't start again until you turned the shaft like a third of a turn and then it would go. So it was just, there was, it was a defective contact inside the motor. But, so that kind of like put a bad taste in my mouth for the bag motor for a couple of years, and the, but then we started using it and they're pretty good. So, um, okay, so next, this one all the way down at the bottom, the BaneBots RS550. So the BaneBots is, is, is motor is made by the company BaneBots. If you guys remember, the BaneBots wheels are those little soft rubber wheels that we use all the time. The BaneBots motor is the fastest and the cheapest motor in FRC. Okay? It's comparable to, it's comparable to the bag motor. It's a little more powerful than the bag motor is. Um, 
it, it runs at 19,000 RPM preload speed, which is cooking. Um, now, that's not necessarily, that's not always an advantage. Running, having a faster preload speed is not always an advantage. In a lot of cases, it means if you want to do something useful with it, you have to have a lot more gearing, right, which adds weight and adds complexity. So RS-550s are good for higher speed mechanisms if you're doing a launcher, right, and you need your launcher to spin at 10,000 RPM. RS-550 is a good one to go with because you don't have to do much gearing. Um, typically, you want to do a little gearing because you don't want to try to run a wheel off of just the motor shaft because of the whole stall torque issue. Um, the, other, the nice thing about the RS-550s is they're dirt cheap. They're like seven bucks. So the SIM, the SIM is like 26, 27. The bag motor and the 775 Pro are like 20. You know, they're not crazy expensive, but the, the Bainbots motor is like seven bucks. Really, really cheap. The problem with the Bainbots motor is it's just like, it's just stupidly easy to burn a 550 motor out. Like, you don't even have to try to burn it out, it will burn out. It, it's bad. It, it, you'll smoke a motor when you're not even stalling it. Right, if you just slow it down enough, it'll smoke. Like, it's, it's not great. But, um, and I assume we can probably see that with the graph. Yeah, it's just, it's like half, it takes like half the time to smoke as the 775 Pro does. But, so, we try not to use them a little, they, they are more powerful than a, than a bag motor, but the bag motor is quite a bit more robust. Internally, they're, they're pretty similar. Okay, then the other, the last motor is the Anywerf 9015. The 9015 is very, very similar to the RS550. Um, like, in terms of its shape and size, it's, it's the exact same outside shape. However, um, the 9015 is, um, well, it's, I'm not sure exactly what's different internally, but basically it's slightly lower power, it's a little harder to burn out. Mm. Still easier than the bag motor, though. So, um, those are the common motors. There are other motors that I didn't top. I didn't cover the other types of 775s because they're not really used anymore. Because the seven, the 775 Pro. We're going to talk about the 775 Pro slash Redline here for a minute because we got some time. Um, this, the 775 Pro is really a game changer, right? It's easy to burn out, but it's still so powerful and so light that in a lot of cases worth risking it because of how powerful and how light it is. It saves a lot of space, a lot of weight, and it, it, it pretty much, it can do everything a SIM can do in terms of wattage. Um, so when the, when the 775 Pro came out, basically every motor in this list that's below the 775 Pro got obsolesced like immediately. Right? Nobody, nobody uses any Mark 9015s anymore. Nobody uses RS 550s. I mean, people do, but, but Pretty much everything that those other motors accomplished is now run off of a, a 775 Pro. Anything you wouldn't run off a 775 Pro, you'll run off of, mini, of a, a bag motor. So there's a big kind of, I don't know, uh, I want to say development arms race going on in FRC started, well, it started ever since the 775 Pro came out in 2016. Um, well, it started more in 2017, but basically, Teams are trying to make 775 Pro slash Redline drivetrains work. So I, I mentioned that on your drivetrain, you want to run some, you want to have some motor that can be stalled for long periods of time because you're going to get in pushing matches, right? Well, with people want to save the weight, right? And for good reason. I mean, you can shed like 10 pounds off your robot if you do six or eight. 775 Pros rather than SIMs. Like it's, 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 there's quite a big advantage to running with that small of a motor. However, it's very, very easy to smoke a motor on your drivetrain, then you're kind of just out of luck. So there's, there's, another, there's another thing to worry about when you're talking about your drivetrains and you're talking about power. And th this comes down to because the fact that we're current limited, right? You can't supply 131 amps to a SIM. First of all, the main breaker of the robot trips at 120, okay? And the each motor circuit 
the, the breakers that are on the actual power distribution uh, panel, those black things that we plug in all the time, those are, limit us to a max of 40 amps per circuit. Okay, so each motor can only get 40 amps. Now, in reality, in reality, um, those all of those breakers take a little bit to pop, especially the main breaker. So when we when we start out, like when we just punch it forward with the joysticks on our drivetrain, we're drawing probably a couple hundred amps. But our main breaker doesn't trip because it takes a long time for the main breaker to heat up and finally trip. So you've got to run kind of a sustained current over 120 amps before it'll actually pop, which is a good thing, otherwise we pop it every time we move. Um, but so if you think about it, if you think about it, um, six sims, you know, six sims at 40 amps each even, what is that? 240 amps total. So, so even at six sims, you can't draw 40 amps in each motor or you'll, you'll pop your main breaker. Um, so when you're designing a drivetrain that, where you want to pack as much power as you can into it, you've got to be thinking about current quite a bit. So what people typically do with 775 Pros is, is to, to combat a, or to rival a six sim drivetrain, what they do is they put eight 775 Pros on the drivetrain, okay? Now the 775 Pro is, for all intents and purposes, the same power as a sim. So if you put eight on there, you have more power than the sims, but then they don't run them at full voltage. So they don't run them at 12 volts. They, they, they cut it off at, well, typically 75%. So if I take, if I'm running at 75% power on, on these motors, that puts me right at the same power as a six sim drivetrain. Now what that gets me is that gets me more, they, that, that means I'm putting less heat into the motor if I stall the motors. I'm putting less heat into each individual motor. However, because the motors are so small and so light, I still, even though I'm adding one extra motor, I'm still getting a huge weight savings. So pretty much everybody who's running 775 Pro drivetrains are getting, they're running eight motors. Um, some people design 10 motor um, gearboxes. Even. And they're, they're doing some software, they're doing some software current limiting so that like when the motor starts out, it starts at a lower voltage, so you're not dumping, you know, 100 amps into it. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot. We might try it in the future. I don't know that we're going to try it this season. We might, if, if the game is something like we dealt with last year, where where there wasn't a lot of pushing and, and there wasn't, you kind of just drove around. We might try doing something like that, but just something to think about. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to CAD here. Uh, for your handout for CAD, I didn't really do a whole lot with it. I just put a kind of a plan view of um, the mechanism that we're designing in two different positions. Now, we're not going to finish this today just with the time we've got. I, just like I did for the gearbox project, I recorded, I guess this is a I recorded a video, which I haven't uploaded it yet, but I'll upload it tonight probably. Um, I recorded a video of me going through the whole modeling process. I still got one more to record. I didn't, I didn't do the one with the fasteners, but I'm going to record that and, and put that up as well. So whatever we don't finish tonight, I want you guys to finish on your own before next week. Um, next week we're going to start another project that's just like this. It's going to take two weeks. We'll kind of go over it. We'll, we'll do as much as we can in the class, and I'll record videos of it. You guys can finish it on your own. So, um, was everybody here, was anybody he here, you weren't here last week, but I gave you files, so you're, you're caught up. Was anybody not here last week? Okay, so did everybody have their thumb drives with their files we worked on last week? Good. Okay. Um, All right, so if you remember, we have this layout sketch. Um, 
was anybody have, if anybody was having trouble picturing what I was talking about in terms of what this mechanism does, that's what I, that's why I printed out these, these views, that you guys can kind of get an idea of exactly what we're doing. Um, do, do, does that make sense, what's going on there? Okay. All right, so last week we made this air cylinder assembly. I'm actually going to rename this file. air cylinder assembly here where this can give us an idea of uh, the uh, center to center distance between the, the back pivot of the motor and the, and the clubs. So we're going to make one change here. So if you guys don't have this open, go ahead and open up your air cylinder assembly. We're going to make a change to this and then we're going to start modeling some stuff. Whatever we don't get here, I'm, I'm going to do this in a little bit different order than I do in the videos. Um, but whatever whatever we don't get done here in the class, you guys can watch the videos and fill in what what we didn't do. So, all right, everybody got your air cylinder assembly open. Okay, so what we need to do is you guys remember when we we did that mate from the back of the clevis to the end of the cylinder to keep the uh, clevis from moving in and out. Basically expand one of the two parts over here in the browser and find that mate. It'll highlight the parts that are clicked when you hover over it. So this is the one I'm looking for up on my screen. There's an angle constraint. It should be the one right above it, but make sure that the, it's the back of this clevis is what's selected. Once you find it, right click and hit edit. Now, if you guys remember, we can put an offset in a constraint, right? So if I, if I go in this offset box and I type in one inch, you can see the clevis moves one inch away from the surface that it's mated to, okay? Now, in our case, the, this, this clevis is actually going to move out and in when the cylinder extends and retracts. You good? I uh, know my browser closed down. I don't know how to Oh, um, go to, I think it's manage. Oh, no, it's, um, it's this little guy right here. Under view, user interface. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anyway, so if I go back and I edit that constraint, we can put in an offset and, and move that clevis around. But but in reality, that clevis actually moves in and out as the cylinder extends and retracts. Now, if you remember what I was talking about last week, the air cylinder is modeled as a solid piece, right? It's modeled as a part, it's not an assembly. So the, the rod of the air cylinder isn't gonna be able to move in and out in our model. Um, but we can, we can allow the clevis to move in and out by itself without the rod of the air cylinder moving and that'll kind of simulate what we want. It'll look a little weird, but it'll, it'll be functionally the same as what will actually happen on the real air cylinder. However, our mate prevents that from moving. Well, if I don't don't do this, but if I suppress the mate, right, temporarily get rid of it, I can move it out way out here. Well, it, in reality, uh, you know, it, it's only going to move four inches. Okay. So I, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to limit the clevis's motion. 
So if I edit this mate, and I click this little, these two little arrows here, it'll open up a bottom part of this dialog. And I can specify a maximum and minimum offset for that mate. So check both of those check boxes. This air cylinder is four, has four inches of travel, so set maximum to four, leave minimum at zero, and click OK. Now you should be able to move the clevis out, and it should stop at four inches. And you should be able to move it in, and it'll stop at zero. You guys get that? All right, so we're gonna, that, that'll be useful later. We're gonna kind of table that and we'll come back to it. Okay, so um, it, as you see on your little sheet here, we've got this like stick thing that, that, that rotates up and down, right? That, that, that's a piece of two, two or uh, that's a piece of one by one aluminum tubing. Basically, it represents the mechanism that we would be moving up and down. We'll call it the John Wick stick. <laughs> um, but basically, there would be a mechanism attached to that. In this particular example, we're not modeling a mechanism, but we're just going to have a, a stick that moves up and down. So, okay, but we need we need to model that part. So we're gonna we're gonna start a new part. It's just going to be a standard part. Do all of you know how to create a new standard part by now? No. <laughs> okay, so once you've done that, go to the rectangle drop down box. We're going to pick a two point center rectangle and we're going to model a piece of one by one tubing with a one sixteenth of an inch wall. Okay, so you're going to create a one inch by one inch square using whatever method you prefer. Then you're going to use the offset tool to offset that square a sixteenth of an inch in from where it is when you created it. Coulter and Andrew, you should both be watching to make sure everybody can model a piece of one by one tube. It is an important skill because we use a lot of it on our robots. We use more sheet metal, but we use a lot of one by one. Okay, everybody got that? All right, so finish the sketch, and it's one one inch by one inch, and it's a sixteenth of an inch. The walls are a sixteenth of an inch thick. All right, so click the extrude tool. We're going to extrude this out. So pick the region you want, which is going to be the outer kind of ring. Um, the length of this doesn't particularly matter. So we're just going to make it twelve inches. Now, something that I like to do is I like to, I like to split the difference. I like to extrude on either side so the sketch is in the middle of the tube rather than on one end. So if I click this button here, this symmetric button, third from the left, it'll, it'll symmetrically extrude on either side of the sketch. Okay? I typically do that for longer parts. So I do that for standoffs. I do that for pieces of tubing. That for longer parts. If I'm doing a flat part, like a bracket, I don't bother. You, you could, but I, it's just typically not worth it in my mind. So um, this this can help you. It's, it's a good practice to do. I'm not going to really go into why it's important, but um, if you need it, it helps. So click OK. Set the material to aluminum, 6061. All right, and let's give this a save real quick before we move on. I um, how long is that tubing? Twelve inches. Um, just FYI, with the order that I'm doing stuff in, um, the part numbers are going to be different than they are in the video. So I, I don't think you guys are going to care. I need them different. Okay, so now, you 
can't really see what's going on. You can't really see what's going on in the view when you're drawing. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to have a standoff that goes across. And the standoff is going to act as an axle. Okay? And basically this, this tube here is going to pivot on that stationary axle, right? So the, the standoff's not going to rotate, but the our mechanism is going to rotate around the standoff. Okay? Now we need some sort of a bearing. Okay? Now we're not rotating particularly fast. Um, we're not rotating much at all. We're rotating 90 degrees. So I think we're going to use a bushing. Okay. So let's go. Let's go to McMaster Car. So pull up your browser. Go to McMaster.com. Now, do you guys remember? Do you guys remember when we talked about bearings, like the second week of the class? Yeah. You guys remember talking about plane bearings? Um, sure. Okay. Plane, plane bearings don't have two moving pieces. They just they're just basically a round surface that something slides inside. So that would be a bushing. That's a bushing is just another another word for a plane bearing. But plane, bushing, bushing can, bushing can refer to things other than plane bearings. So when you say bushing, you don't always mean plane bearing, right? It can mean one or the other. Okay, so in the search box, just type in bushings, not standard drill bushings, gosh darn. Bearings. What you're looking for is Flange sleeve bearing. Sleeve bearing is another word for a bushing or a plane bearing. Have fun remembering all this. It'll be on the test. Okay, so go to flange sleeve bearings. Now, the reason we need the flange, well, it will become apparent why we need the flange. Okay, so what we're going to do is this, this top option right here, oil embedded flange sleeve bearings, also known as oil light bearings. Oil light's a brand, um, and that's pretty much what everybody uses. So. We're going to go with oil light bearings. All right, now typically, the material we typically use, we've got a lot of it laying around, so that's why we use it. It's 3 eighths of an inch round aluminum rod, right? That's what we make our standoffs out of. You guys remember on the gearbox product, the standoffs, the four standoffs at the corners of the gearbox that held the whole thing together? Okay, we're going to make something just like that, okay? And that is going to be the axle that this bushing needs to ride on. So. If the standoff is 3 eighths of an inch outside diameter, what does the inside diameter of the bushing need to be? It's not a trick question. It's really, really easy. If the outside diameter of the rod is 3 eighths ish, what ish diameter does the inside of the bushing need to be? Slightly larger than that. Right. Basically, yeah, very, very slightly larger. So the same size, basically. So what size is that? Um, come on, come on, guys. You guys can get this. <laughs> I'll take it. All right. <laughs> the inside diameter of the bushing needs to be six sixteenths of an inch. I had a guy I used to work with, and he. He would he would say things like he would say things like yeah we need to make that about four sixteenths. I'm like, <laughs> he did he legitimately didn't understand how to reduce fractions. Like, he didn't understand. I'm like, come on, it's a quarter of an inch. All right, so over here on the side, four shaft diameters. You're gonna have to scroll down a little bit. Find three eighths of an inch. Now a bushing that's three eighths of an inch is gonna be very slightly oversized, right? going to be one thousandth of an inch larger-ish, I think. And, and I don't know, these might be, I don't know how to manufacture, but anyways. Um, all right, so where it says four housing IB inside diameter, just go with a half an inch. There's no reason to go with anything larger. We're putting it in a fairly small tube, so we need space. All right, so we have four options. We have a quarter inch long, half, two options at a half inch long, and three quarters of an inch long. Okay? Um, I'm not going to spend time having the discussion about why we would pick one versus the other, but, but basically pick the short one. 
we're gonna go with quarter inch. That's all we need, and that's all we really have room for. So pick a quarter inch. We could use the half inch long ones, but they, in our particular application, they're, they're, they're not gonna serve any real purpose. The extra length isn't gonna do us any good. So pick the shorter one, click on product detail, download a step file. Once you've got that step, step file downloaded, show it in folder and, and move it into your, cut it out of there and move it to your folder for this project. I have a folder called Humanic Joint. But you probably do too. That's what all the cool kids are doing. <laughs> Alright, everybody get that file downloaded and moved? Awesome, you good? Yeah. Alright, so we're going to go ahead, we're going to go back to Inventor. We're going to go to Open under Files of Type right here. And click the drop down list. And click All Files. And then find this one here that says oil embedded flange sleep bearing. Uh, yeah, but were you sitting on the end last week? Um, we, um, Click that end computer, because there was a flash drive. No, no. You weren't sitting there. Okay. There was a, I don't know who's flash drive. Somebody's flash Somebody drive. Someone told say Tyson C. Okay, so um, yeah. once you find that file, Stand open it up. Right. Click OK to the dialog when it comes up. We've got to delete this sketch out of here like we always do. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but I don't think it's done. Um, Coulter, Andrew, you want to help him? All right, so delete the sketch out of it. So right click on the sketch in the browser and delete. All right, so next you're going to set the material in the drop down. I just usually set it to bronze cast. The oil light bearings are actually centered, they're not actually cast, but it's the closest thing. What? You mean the color? Yes. It's so awful. It's called PB Brown. Actually, it's bronze satin. Okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna put an ax a work axis in the middle of this bearing. So we're gonna click on axis and click on the inside surface of the bearings. Now we have a work axis if we need it. So give this a save when you're all done. If you get your caught up, yeah. All right, everybody got their bushing imported, material changed, axis created, saved. Your computer is still functioning. You haven't pulled your hair out yet. Okay, you can close that file. We don't need it. All right, so if you remember correctly, the outside diameter. I'm actually going to leave mine open just to show you. But um, so we've got this flange. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to put a hole in the sides of this tube, okay? And we're going to push this bushing into those holes, okay? The flange of the bushing will prevent the bushing from being able to like fall inside the tube, right? So, so we'll push it until the flange is on the outside of the tube and it will stay there. Now, this tube is only a sixteenth of an inch thick, right? It, it's very thin. Okay, this bushing here, this is 3 sixteenths of an inch. So we're not utilizing the full width of the bushing. And, and, and in reality, for any kind of a mechanism with any kind of significant force on it, a sixteenth of an inch of material riding on your bearing is not enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna reinforce this tube with a bracket on the outsides. Okay, we'll probably make it an eighth of an inch thick if it's an eighth of an inch plus the sixteenth of the tube, that'll be three sixteenths, which will actually neatly use up 
all of the bushings length. It doesn't always work out that perfectly, but in this case, it, we happen to get a bushing that was just the right length. Okay. And that's the reason why using a longer bushing would have, wouldn't have really done us any good. We could have used a bushing that was a half inch long, but there just would have been extra bushing sticking out on the inside of the tube that wouldn't have been really serving much of a purpose. It would provide a little bit of support, but not enough to do it that way. Um, okay, so we, we're going to go ahead and put the hole in this tube, and then we'll, we're going to model the brackets next. So create a sketch on the side of the tube. Now, the way I usually do this, this is the way I did it in the videos. I turn on construction geometry. Then I go to project geometry. And I click this end line of the tube right here, the one that's highlighted on my screen. So I click that. So that projects a construction line of this edge. Then I get out of the uh, project geometry tool with escape. Then I go to a line. Construction geometry is still on. Then I pick the center point. I pick the center point of the line I just projected. I click and I make a horizontal line. Now, our tube is an inch tall, right? It's one inch by one inch. It's an inch tall. I want, I want the pivot point to be kind of like centered on the end of the tube, right? So, so the, the pivot point's gonna be a half inch from the top of the tube, half inch from the bottom of the tube, and I want it to be half inch from, in from the end of the tube. So I'm gonna make this little line that I'm drawing 0.5 inches long, and then I'm gonna press enter to finish that. And then I'm gonna get out of the line tool with the escape key. Okay, so next, I'm gonna use the point tool, I'm going to create a point right on the end point of this line. Okay. Then I'm going to finish the sketch. Now, why do I do it that way? That's just the way I do it. You could accomplish the same thing by placing a point in the sketch using a horizontal constraint to align the point to the midpoint of the line and then just dimension between the two. However, if I can do something with geometry, instead of constraints, I typically will. So if I can draw a line, instead of going up and placing a constraint, I'll draw the line. But that's just personal preference. You guys can find a way that works for you. This is just how I do it. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're not breaking your model, which there are things you can do that will break your model, but dimensioning a hole from the end of the tube probably is not one. Well. All right, so to create our hole, we're going to use, guess what? The hole feature. So the termination is going to be through all because we want it to go through both sides of the tube. The diameter is going to be the outside diameter of this part of the um, bushing, which is a half an inch. So type in 0.5. That's all we're going to do on this part for now, so give it a save. <laughs> you guys good there? No, I was very confused. All right. So. Let's go back to our layout sketch here for a second. Let's look at this. So I'm going to draw on the screen again because I can. It's easy. All right, so if, you, if you're looking at your sheet that has the example, this hole, that hole that we just created is here. Okay, this is where the bushing is. That's where the pivot is. Okay, so that tube that we just made in the vertical position is going to be like this. Okay, now. We need to, in the retract, so this is in the retracted position. In the retracted position, this is where the, the pin of the clevis of the air cylinder is. Okay, so we've got to attach that pin to this mechanism somehow. Now, we've got this line here that's representing, that's representing our lever arm, right? Okay, so 
true or false, do we have to have a piece of metal that runs straight from this point to that point? True or false? False. False. You just don't, right? I can I can make a bracket that looks like, right? And attach way up here. You could. I could do that. Now, as long as it was rigid. Now, obviously, that would be pretty flimsy. But if it was rigid, that would work. Like, that would that would rotate up and down just like it was supposed to. And that'd be dumb, but you know, it would work. Right. We've uh, we've determined that we are tend we tend to be better at aesthetic than actual function, but that's not the goal of building a robot. Very so. aesthetic to like not function. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Losing hardcore on the field is not a good aesthetic. So we're gonna try to avoid that aesthetic. <laughs> we we lost no, hardcore. You do you think we lie. didn't lose hardcore? <laughs> You guys remember where our elevator popped out this track every single match? That's what you call losing hardcore. Alright. Um, okay, um, okay, so we just need to attach this center point to the tube somehow. Right? So the easiest way to do that is to just go. Like that. Yeah, I like the first one better. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not doing the first one. Okay. Now, in reality, there's going to be some side load on this bracket, right? As, as it extends, there's going to be some side load. So I prefer to make the bracket look more like this, right? And then we're going to rivet it to the side of the tube. So, so it's going to have to overlap the tube like this, and then we'll have holes. Right, we're going to do this. Right, we're going to have holes that go down. Right? No. Right, it's almost like the picture I gave you guys. It's like, almost like I've done this before. Like, it's almost like this is the third time that I've modeled this. Is, I modeled it once on my own, then once for the video, and now the third time. I'm not getting sick of it at all yet. <laughs> it's like, I've done this already. All right, anyways. Um, so now you guys remember that I mentioned that we wanted to reinforce the end of the tube with another plate, right? So, to give us a little more surface area for our bushing to attach to. So it works out just because of how close these are together that it, it's convenient just to combine the two into one bracket just to take this bracket, extend this bracket out a little bit, and just put the hole in the end, right? So that's kind of the that's kind of the finished shape. So we've got to we've got to figure out what that's going to be. Now we know that this is going to be straight up. Okay, we know. So we just need to know basically the distance between this point, the center point here, and the center point here in this direction. Okay, which is just going to be. The, the y distance between the two. And we also need to know the horizontal distance between the two. And then and then we can put this into a sketch and model this bracket. Okay. Think we can do it? Probably not, but we're gonna try to I like your optimism. Alright. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. Erase this so you guys don't have to look at the sketch while I'm moving around. I need you so much. Very well erased. I need you so much. Stop. I think that's a Microsoft Edge trick. <laughs> yes, I just didn't know. All right. Three times. Alrighty. Too many times. There we go. Alright, uh, okay, so I'm gonna go back to our layout sketch here. I'm gonna press the M key for the measure tool. I'm gonna click on this little red dot right here for that 
point, and I'm going to click on this little dot right here for that point. Now remember we wanted the horizontal distance and the vertical distance between the two. Okay, so if you go to, in your measure toolbox, if you click on delta, it'll, it'll change. So it'll, it'll give you the delta x and the delta y, which is super hard to read. Um, I'm going to write these dimensions down, so I don't have to try to remember them. So x, actually I do remember them. So x was 2.251, y was 1.713. Did I get it right? No. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to remember those numbers. Now, this is, this is the useful thing about having a layout sketch, right? You can just go in and measure this stuff once you've already designed it so it'll work. Okay, so the layout sketch gets all the geometry so the geometry works, and then you go in and you just use the measure tool to figure out dimensions that you need, then you go model your parts, okay? Now, if you have to make a change, you make a change to your layout sketch, then you have to change your parts, right? Which can be kind of a pain in the butt, there are other ways of doing it, but they tend to end in disaster, so this is the way I always do it. And I just make it right on the first time, because that's something I can do. <laughs> you will always have to change it. Like, you will always go back to it. Alright, so let's create a new part. This will just be a standard part. Alright, so we're going to start the origin. This is going to represent the pivot point. Okay, so how big was the hole? How big was the hole for the bushing? Half an inch. Half an inch. So let's create a circle on the origin point that's half an inch in diameter. Now, when I drew that drawing up here of that bracket, I drew it like vertically. We're gonna rotate it horizontally just because it's more intuitive. So so we're gonna when we're talking about our x and our y dimensions, we're gonna have to flip the two. Because instead of looking at it on its side, we're going to look at it like when the mechanism is laying flat, just because it's less annoying to do it that way. It's, it's less annoying to have to flip X in a while. Uh, is it? We're going to do it. Okay. I don't know. I just like looking at the bracket horizontally than vertically. We could model it vertically, but I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, so before, you know, the, the, the cylinder clevis was here, right? Okay, well, if we rotate 90 degrees, it's going to be over here. Okay, so, and our, and our row of holes are, so our tube is going to be here, and our, our pin point's going to be here. So, the clevis pin is a quarter inch in diameter. We're going to use a quarter inch bolt instead of an actual pin, because we're cheap like that. Um, typically, just the, the whole size that I've been using, when, when, we, when we we're talking about laser cutting, Part, the whole size I have us use is 0.255 for a really close fitting quarter inch hole. It gives you a little bit of space that you can get a quarter inch bolt through there, but it's pretty much, there's no sloth, basically. So we're going to model a circle up in this region that's 0.255 inches in diameter. You guys get that? You guys think you can handle that? Got that circle sorted. All right. All right. We're going to use the dimension tool. We're going to use these two dimensions that we just uh, got from our layout sketch. We're going to put them in here. So click on the center point of your, your pin circle and the center point of your uh, pivot circle. So we're going to have to create a horizontal dimension and a vertical dimension. Doesn't matter what you do first. The vertical dimension, like I'm doing here, is going to be the x, x number, so 2.251. Then the horizontal dimension, you'll click the center points again. So you'll just bring it down to the bottom, and then that'll be the y, so 1.713. Okay, so next 
now we got to start. So now we have the two important features, right? The, these these two holes are the like real, real important features of the part. Now we're going to build the part around this. This is an important technique. You want to locate the stuff that's important first, because in most cases the outside profile of a bracket really doesn't make a big difference, right? You want to get the you want to get the bearing holes. You want to get all that stuff in place first, because that's stuff that's really important. Then you model the outside of the bracket to give yourself enough room to mount it. And then the last thing you do is you go in and add the actual mounting holes themselves in, in cases like this. And, and you'll see me follow that workflow in the video. So, all right. So next, we're, we, need, we, know, we know that we want a little like extension on the edge of this bracket. The bracket kind of looks like a triangle like I drew on the screen. But then we want a little extension to mount to the tube. So, we're going to draw the top of that extension with just a horizontal line up here. Okay, and that I'm still still creating lines, and so now I'm going to create a, a vertical line. This is going to represent the end of the tube, right? This will the end of this bracket will line up flush with the end of the tube, basically. So I'm going to create a horizontal or vertical line there like that. Then I'm going to run a long horizontal line back the other way. This will represent the bottom of the tube. This will be the whole width of the bracket. Okay. Next, um, I want I want a nice square end, the height of the tube on the back end of the bracket. That's just common practice. Makes it a little easier to assemble. Makes it look nice, and it may, means make sure you have plenty of material left to put your holes in. Okay. So we're gonna draw a line back up. If you get this like horizontal line that's like connecting, so you see that line that appears. If you get that, that's fine. Make sure your line straight up and down and click. That's all the lines you're going to place for the moment. All right. The next thing we're going to do is we want we want just the top of the triangle triangle to be a nice round arc, right? That we don't need any square corners or anything up here, so we're just going to make a nice round arc. So pick the drop down list by the arc, click the bottom one, which is center point. Then you're going to click on the center of the hole. You're going to go out from that a little bit. You're going to start over here. You're going to click, and you're going to click again over here. And we'll we'll connect that and dimension it and constrain it here in a second. So press escape to get out of that tool. Then you're going to go back to the line tool and connect connect one side of the arc to this line over here and the other side of the arc to this line over here. like that. <laughs> now, once again, this is another fairly important workflow thing that I do. I get the important stuff that I need. I need a bushing hole, and I need a hole for the air cylinder pin. Okay, I know that. Then I know what I'm bolting to, right? I know what I'm going to rivet this bracket to. I'm going to attach this bracket to the tube. So I need to make, I mean to make nice square corners for the tube. And then up at the top, I'm not, there's nothing up there, so I'm going to make round things. So I kind of just draw a really rough outline. I just rough it out. No dimensions, no constraints, no nothing. Right? I just draw the outline roughly the shape I want it. Then I go back and I start adding constraints and I start adding dimensions and I start pulling, kind of pulling this outer profile into the shape it needs to be. Okay? So that's what we're going to do now. So first off, um, we've got this arc, we've got these lines attached to this arc. We know that we want those to be tangent, right? Because that's what's going to look best. So let's get a tangent constraint going. Let's attach a tangent, this line to the arc, and, and the other angled line to the arc. So you just click on one, then the other, then you go to the other side and click on one, then the other. Okay. And it should, stuff is going to move around, but don't worry about it just yet. Press escape once you're done with that. Okay, now this goes back to, well, this goes back to something I was talking about earlier. We need to make sure that this point here is straight across from this point here. Now, there's two ways you can do this. Well, there's more than two ways, but there's, there's two ways you can do this that I'm going to talk about. First of all, you can use a horizontal constraint and just click on one corner and click on the other, which is fine. That works. Um, that's not the way I would do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on construction geometry. 
I'm going to go to the line tool and I'm going to connect oops, I'm going to connect one green endpoint to the other green endpoint. And I, I, you can see the symbol right here. The, it automatically placed a horizontal constraint on that line. So that line is now constrained to be horizontal, which is the same thing as using a horizontal constraint. Now, this is, this can be a little more work, but the reason that I do this is because it's visual, right? I see that dotted line running across there. I know that those are straight across from each other. If there was a horizontal constraint on there, you wouldn't be able to see it. So if I come back in a week and I need to edit this part and I don't remember what's going on here, I see that dotted line and I know what's going on. And it's easier to delete this dotted line if I don't want these two points to be horizontal from each other in the future, say something changes and I need to change something on the part and I don't want them to be horizontal anymore. It's easier to delete that line than it is to go in and delete a constraint. So that's why I do it this way. Once again, though, this is a personal preference thing. Just find a way that makes sense and that works for you and just do it. So, um, all right, so now, um, Basically, we've got, well, okay, let's, let's focus on this end now. So we know, we know this is going to be an inch tall. <coughs> so let's go ahead and dimension that. So place in a dimension, just dimension that to be an inch. Okay. Now, we know that this hole is centered, is centered in the two. So you can dimension half inch from the bottom. You can use a horizontal constraint as a midpoint of this line. Or like what I usually do is I make a construction line and I connect the center point to the center point of the line. Right? Now you'll notice that line is not horizontal. So I have to actually place a horizontal constraint on that line. Once again, this is actually more mouse clicks than just using a horizontal constraint, but the reason I do it that way is just so that the visual representation in the sketch of what's going on. So if you prefer to do the easier route and just use a horizontal constraint, that's perfectly viable. So these top two lines top and bottom horizontal lines should be blue now. They should be fully constrained. Coulter and Andrew, you want to take a spin around and make sure everybody's getting this? Yeah. All right. So next, we need to dimension the end of the bracket to be a half inch from the center of the hole. Right, so that's, that's what it was on the two. What? But um, don't we just do a horizontal to the middle of the circle to that? So place this uh, half inch dimension down, guys. And um, yeah. 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 So we've got a few we got a few things we need to do here. So first of all, we need to we need to dimension the overall width of this bracket. Okay. Um, we need to make sure. So so in every riveted part that we put on the robot want to have three rivets per connection. Right? So we have two tubes joining each other. Each bracket I want them to have three rivets. Okay. 
Sometimes we can't do that, sometimes we can only do two, but typically, especially for structural stuff, we want at least three. More if we can, but we don't want to get ridiculous. For stuff with load on it, three sometimes is not enough. The rivets don't break, but they can pop out if they get twisted at a weird angle, and that's like, it doesn't take, it takes less force to pop the rivets out than it does to shear them. Each one of those rivets is like 300 pounds of shear force, so you're not going to shear the rivet. Yeah. It's helpless recoil when you did it. Oh, what? No, when you changed it, the horizontal thing was frozen. Oh, okay. So, okay. so, so we haven't constrained that part yet, so you can just click and drag. That's why you made the first bracket you showed us when you drew it, because you have more space to put rivets with all the curves. See? But also, it's not touching the actual curve. <laughs> <laughs> but you can <laughs> add more rivets in there. You can put as many rivets out there as you want, but they're not going to attach anything. <laughs> okay, so, so anyways, we can't put rivets too close to this bushing. Um, we're probably not going to get to that today, but you'll see in the video why that is. Um, so. I, we're gonna put, we typically put rivets every half inch. So we start a half inch from the end of the bracket and we put rivets every half inch. And so what ends up working out for us is we make this bracket 3.5 inches long overall. So that gets us, that gets us four rivets because this is gonna have some force on it. We wanted four <laughs> rivets on there. Oh, well, just click it, just click it and drag it. Just, oh, is that what's going on? Okay, yeah, just, just the, that corner that's sticking way out the side, you just gotta, because when, when, when you have stuff that's not constrained, it, things can move around as they please. So you've just gotta, you just gotta click and drag them as they freak out and move back, kind of like, kind of like the you had. You just gotta click and drag. Whoa. All right. Oh, okay, we'll dimension the arc and then you should be able to do that. So, okay. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll, let's, 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 we'll, we'll solve this problem in a roundabout way. Okay, so let's, let's dimension, just to get them out of a bind, let's dimension this top arc here. So, if we get the dimension tool, we click on the arc. Um, I don't remember what, I think I just did 0.375. That gives it, it means it's small. Small radius, but there's enough meat all the way around that you're not gonna like tear out this pin or anything. You make this too small, you know, you'll end up fatiguing and breaking. <laughs> it's still broken. It's still broken. <laughs> okay, so what you can do, what you can do, well, oh, first of all, can you click on the actual corner? Don't don't drag the line, drag, drag the actual corner point. So can you do that? No. It won't let you do it either. Really? Okay, so delete, delete this line. Just delete this line, move the, drag the end point of the line back inside, then put that line back in. That's, that's, my, that's, that's my best explanation for you. We'll let, uh, we'll let Tyson struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like both of us. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Make sure you put your uh, tangent constraint back in, Luz. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. When you add that line back, you're going to add your tangent constraint. Okay. I think that's what broke it in the first place. Is the map is going to like, work totally There you go. Make sure you're. All right, so this is uh, this is kind of a nifty thing. So so now we've got one one thing that's not constrained. Everything else, see look, see, see look. So I can just move. Yeah. No. Really? Well, does it move? Weird. Mine does. I have the teacher station. My copy of Inventor is less than Wait, are you trying to buy the Oh, I wonder. By the end. 
Alright, <laughs> anyway. Alright, so we've got one one thing that we have to nail down. So we want this to be the same as this side, right? We want this to be kind of symmetric because that would look pretty good. So we, we can do kind of a nifty trick, right? We've got this line here, right? And this line is connected from here to here. If we constrain a vertical constraint from the center point of this line to the center of this hole, that'll force this line to be centered around this hole, which will force these two endpoints of these two angled lines to be equidistant on either side. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do that. So let's grab a vertical constraint, click the center of the hole, click find the center point of this dotted line and click that. Down in the corner, down here in the bottom right hand corner, you should see fully constrained. You see fully constrained? Yes. Okay, so finish the sketch. Say yes. No. Andrew. Help us. <laughs> his, his sketch isn't fully constrained, so he's not that coming this in. No, not that man, this man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, not this man. Not the special one. Oh, hey, buddy. <laughs> we're in the same boat. We're all. We're all just a little special. <laughs> Should we choose the build role? You need help? Okay. Horizontal constraint, these two, and then you can make it. I'll be proud of Austin when I see what Austin <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, it says it's over constraining though. Well, don't over constrain it. I don't know how. Hey, Schulter, you just help that man. Tool, click the region. This is going to be an eighth of an inch thick. That is thick over the two seams. <laughs> All right. Uh, set the material to aluminum. Give it a save. I'm just going to give mine the next number in the series. together. So create a new assembly. Just a standard uh, IAM. This guy right here. So create. Um, F6 is the same as clicking this little house button because for some reason in an assembly it always starts you in the front view, which I never want. I want to go into the isometric view. So either click the house or hit F6 every time you start a new assembly. Just do it. 
Okay, um, if, if you guys remember, I, I showed it in the video, I don't think I've taught it in the class. Basically, this little pinwheel here, you see how there's like this little pie slice that goes around? So if I right click, okay, so this is, this is specifying a direction. So if I start moving my mouse in a direction, I press and hold the right mouse, if I start moving my mouse in a direction, press and hold the right mouse button, you can see it's like drawing this little line. Mm -hmm. Then I let go of the mouse button. Basically what it'll do, whatever direction I move my mouse in, it'll click the button that's in that direction on this little pinwheel here. So like place component, which is what we want to do, is straight up. So I start moving my mouse, press the right, mou right mouse button, let go of the right mouse button. And you can do it really fast, like, like this. Right, it's just a little flick of the mouse. So that's a really easy way to access really, really commonly used commands. So place components, just flick of the mouse up. You can also right click and click the button, or you can click up here on the ribbon. There's at least three ways to do pretty much every command in Inventor. There's also probably a keyboard shortcut for it. Yeah, you can also hit P if you want, which weirdly enough I never do. But. Okay, so let's place a component. Let's place our let's place our tube. It's probably named John Wick stick. <laughs> okay, open and just uh, place right click and place grounded in origin. And then get out of it because there's only going to be one John Wick stick in the system. Alright, so next we're going to place our bracket. So go and pick the bracket, open. Now we need to rotate this where it's going to be one on the back side of the tube and one on the front side of the tube. So I'm going to rotate, I'm going to right click and rotate once by the y axis. I'll turn it like that. That's the direction it's supposed to be facing. Okay. So I'm going to place one behind the tube and one kind of in front of the tube like this. Just drop them down somewhere that's close to where they need to go and, and we'll constrain them here in a second. So get us, press escape once you place two of those down. to constrain these, so the constraint tools just kind of up and to the right, or you can click constrain on the ribbon, or you can right click and click constrain, or you can hit, I don't know, I think the C, C key works. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to constrain the inside face of this bracket to the outside face of the tube. So we're going we're gonna to leave it on the mate constraint option, so click on the bracket, rotate around and click on the tube then click apply. Then we're going to constrain the inside of this bracket to the outside of the tube. Click apply. Now, now we need to line up the ends of the bracket with the end of the tube. So switch, switch the constraint to flush mode. Click the end of the bracket and the end of the tube. Then click apply. End of the bracket to the end of the tube. Click apply. Now, to do the same thing for the bottom, keep it on the flush constraint option. Bottom of the bracket, bottom of the tube, apply. Bottom of the bracket, bottom of the tube, apply. Coulter. 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 Is this the reflection where you can see the guy with the motorcycle? No, that was a different one. Are you Not. sure? I'll, I'll hit you up. Oh. No, this is like a house with a couple of cars in oh, front of it. Oh, I see a handicap parking spot. That's <laughs> <laughs> you, Tyson. What? That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's a little bunch of cards. I got a bunch of cards. 
it actually is. Oh, I see a trash can. <laughs> For sure. Whoa. I mean, I've seen it. There's a guy. There he is. Wait, you found him? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you got to spin around. Wait, Wait. Wait. Right. there's a yellow land right. right. So oh, that's not the, no, that's not a Lambo. <laughs> no, no, not a Lambo. It's very hard. Oh, yeah, that's a... Yeah, it, it looked like a Land Rover, but because it's zoomed in so much, I was just like, along with all of this. I saw the big old back one. I think, it's, I think it's the outside. I think that skybox, you can change what that skybox is. I think that skybox is like outside of Autodesk's, one of Autodesk's offices or something. All right, anyways, back to our assembly. We've got a couple of minutes here. Let's go ahead and constrain the bushings into this. Why don't I have the little mouse button? Give me. Why is just this assembly frozen? Yes. I didn't. But I just did. Alright, give me three. Okay. okay. Um, Alright, so place, uh, go find your bushings. I'm going to delete my sphere because I don't need it. Alright, place a bushing. Alright, so I'm going to rotate once by the z axis. Right, and that's facing the right direction for the front bracket. I'm going to rotate twice by the x-axis to rotate it around 180 degrees so it's facing this way for the other side. Does that make sense? So you want your two bushings facing like this. <laughs> all right, you guys all got that? Hey, Coulter. Yes. Help that woman. <laughs> oh, man. That was amazing. All right, we're going to use a different constraint here just because I'm lazy. All right, so go to the constraint tool. Gosh, I'm Sometimes the little right drag thing lags out and it makes a mess. Yeah, right. <laughs> Alright, so if we go to this fourth option here, it says insert. Basically, it's a combination of two different constraints and it's easy. It makes it easy to insert like fasteners and bearings and stuff. I hardly ever use it, but I should really get in the habit of using it more often. So we're going to use it. So um, what you do is basically you pick a circle that's going to be up against the flat surface, I guess is the best way to explain it. So you can pick this circle or this circle. I'm going to pick this one. You click that, and then you pick the mating circle on the hole you want to insert it into, and you click on it. So basically what it does is it aligns the axes and then it, it, it puts the two faces together. All right, then to do that again on the other side, I'm going to pick this circle right here. This circle here would work just as well, but this circle. And then I'm going to pick the, the outside rim of the hole and I click apply. Then I'm going to get out of the constraint tool, go back to my home view, give my model a save. <laughs> Alright, that's all we're going to do for today. I'll, I'll get those videos uploaded tonight. You, could, you know you can rename files. No, it's too late. Just permanently assembly one. All right, make sure you save everything you've got. Make sure you take your flash drive with you, otherwise you'll have to redo all this. I'll upload those videos tonight. They should be up tomorrow morning, by tomorrow morning. And then you guys can finish this project. 
try to have this done before next week because we're going to start a different project next week and you're going to want to not have to do two projects at once. Because it's not like it's not like we're going to have to do like 50 projects at once when we're designing a robot.